Are you on the RCR mailing list? Never miss a beat of the news and hard-hitting stories you've come to know and love. Stay in the loop. Visit realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Welcome to The Crunch, Catherine. It's good to have you on the show for the first time. Thank you, Cam. It's great to be talking to you. I'm pleased to be on. Yeah, well, you've been on with Paul Brennan a couple of times, uh, and uh, you sent an email after last week's political panel where I was on with Alfred Naro and Annie O'Brien, and uh, it was a bit of a rant, and I thought, <laughs> I thought, you know what, there's some very good points here, and so I thought I'd make the show this week about having guests on it of people who had written in lengthy emails about particular topics that they seem to know about. So uh, you you uh, you actually also called me a troublemaker too, didn't you? <laughs> Only in the nicest possible way. <laughs> yeah, trouble seems to find me. <laughs> now, um, one of the topics that we were discussing last week was housing and the debacle that is going on inside Kainga Aura, which is if it was a private company, it would be flat broke uh, and trading insolvent. Uh, and you uh, made some points on that. So let's cover off on those things that you talked about. Right. Well, I think one of the things that I was having a rant about in relation to both the subjects that I raised mm-hmm. was that, um, you know, I've, I've been uh, in and around government a long time. And yeah, I, I, I was looking at, as looking at your CV and looking at your profile. I said, I can't read this. It's too long. You've got too much experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I started off as a um, lonely little, you know, policy analyst, operational management person, and in, in uh, the public service. And you know, I was then I was um, promoted to senior position. So. You know, I was a public servant for 10 years and then I went into consulting and I was a consultant to both uh, central and local government for a number of years. Mm. And then I went overseas um, and was basically a consultant in governance and um, public management, uh, mainly in the form of running large projects um, for some of the international agencies. So, you know... But these days, um, you know, one of the things I'm fascinated about is that um, when we look at um, government policies, everybody looks at it from a present, a current state perspective. Yes. And we never, we never, for some reason, look back on the history. And housing is is a particularly um, important area of our whole um, welfare state provision and. Mm. But, but no, nobody goes back and looks at the history of various government housing interventions and over the decades and where have significant changes been made? What's been the result of those? What did you know what are the changing attitudes to um, the government being involved in public housing and the whole area of um, public housing? And um, you know and, we need to look at um, the models that we've had in the past and the models that we've currently got and do an honest honest assessment of of what worked and and why we're in the mess that we're in now. I mean, as you point out, the the review report about uh, Kainga Ori is is absolutely disastrous. You've got an underperforming, overexpending government agency and how has everything got so out of control? The thing is, too, is that many people believe that social housing is almost entirely provided for by the government, but that's not true. They might the government may be the largest landlord and, and the worst landlord at the same time, but the largest landlord. But the vast majority of rental housing in New Zealand is provided by the private sector. That's right. And people forget about that, and then you get morons uh you know like Grant Robertson for example and Phil Twyford who who dream up these wonderful things that sound great the healthy homes uh, is an example of that and they said uh we want to have all these houses well ventilated and well heated well you can't have both at the same time <laughs> it's just it's not possible right <laughs> so, yes <laughs> so so they then prescribed that uh, you had to have a, a heating device or a heat pump or something like that in houses. 
And then they made the stupidest mistake ever. They said, um, we think that uh, the landlords will absorb this cost and they won't pass it on to the tenants, which is utter horseshit. I mean, to use a very blunt term, it's complete, you know, if you're running a business and renting houses as a business, you're going to pass on your costs. Of course you are. And I know that, that I did that with, with my rental properties. Uh, conveniently, just before uh, Christmas a couple of years ago, the tenants moved out uh, out of both places. Uh, I immediately upgraded it to the healthy homes uh, standard. I took the amount that I spent on that. I divided it by 52, and that was the increase in rent for both properties. Well, there you go. <laughs> I, I rounded it up to the nearest $10. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Simple logic. But, well, you know, and every landlord would have done that. But then we had Labor telling people who are renters, don't worry, your rent go, won't go up because we've now stipulated that, that the landlord will have to spend $5,000 installing a heat pump. It was lunacy. And rents did go up. They went up hugely under yes. the term of the Labor government. Yeah. But I think, you know, what um, what struck me as I was reading through the report on the review that's just been done of Kainga Ora is not only astonishment of how you can have such a poorly performing government agency and, you know, how has that happened and what and what's created that mess. Um, and secondly, that they're, even in that review report, they're actually not going back and looking at the mm. model of um, housing intervention um, by government and looking at the whole place of the government in the housing market and the government in public housing. And basically what we've got is um, is a model that's that's been a failure um, since about the early 1990s. And prior to that, we had a model that seemed to work reasonably well. So why can't we go back and look at that? But nobody ever does. And I think part of this is because um, – you know, what's happened in government is that um, for some time, you know, there's been an attitude that nobody over 45 or 50 actually knows anything of any value. Um, the public service is staffed by um, uh, people in their 20s and 30s mostly. Mm. Um, and well, I, don't know about you, not- I don't know about you, Catherine, but people in their 20s and 30s know three-fifths of five-eighths of stuff all. <laughs> well, um, well, I mean, that's one of the things that you've got to look at because um, obviously the quality of people working in the public service <laughs> must be questioned if you've got a completely failing government agency. And so, you know, that's that's one aspect. But I think, you know, people in government are not looking at things from, you know, the perspective of of more than about five years ago. Well, I'll tell you what happens with governments, having been a student of politics for, well, since I was in nappies, really. um, Our electoral system forces politicians to only consider things in three-year blocks. So what they do is they get elected, and then they go hell for leather for the first year and try and get a whole lot of stuff done. In the second year, they stabilise all of the unintended consequences that happened from the first year. And in the third year, they do nothing because they don't want to upset anybody leading into the election. And so as a consequence, you only really get one year in three of actually doing something. Uh, And then once they win a second term, then they're very, very cautious about doing anything because they want to win a third term. But no one gets a fourth term. Yes. So as a consequence, we've got a nine-year period where, or a six-year period, if you're if you're a bad government, you get tossed out after two terms. That's it. But we've got a nine-year period now. Public policy: if you pass a law today, you won't see the effects of that for at least eighteen months, probably two years. And in something like housing, you're not going to see an effect in housing maybe for ten years. By which time you've had a change of government. Yes. Yeah, well, that's that's right, but that doesn't mean that the ability to uh, to look at history 
<laughs> is 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 cut off, <laughs> you know, by by people in government, and you know, again, this is this is a failure of both both governance and the public service because that's exactly what um, people in the public service should be advising ministers. You know, they should be providing proper, um, thought out, well constructed advice. But I I don't think that's been happening for some time. Decades. But, yeah, decades. But de- de- uh, decades. I honestly believe that because uh, I get asked by people who are just touching on politics for the first time. They go, "Well, why doesn't the minister do something about this?" And I say to them, "Well, you don't think the minister knows anything about that, do you?" Because they don't. No, they literally don't. They rely on their officials, and guess where their officials come from? Out of the public service, and yes. often. Uh, And I know this is a case in the current government. You've got National Act and New Zealand First Ministers who have got people in their offices that were advising the Labour government before that. Yes. And so the advice that they give the minister who actually doesn't know anything about the topic is the same advice they gave to the Labour Party, and we wonder why we keep getting the same stuff happening. Yes, well, exactly. It's the same people, whereas in the United States, what happens is the in the departments that they're, they're not run by ministers, they're run by secretaries, right? Secretary of State, Secretary mm-hmm. of Defence. What happens in the United States when they have an election and the and the um, and there's a change of government is that all of those people who were advising the Secretary of Treasury or the Secretary of Defence they all lose their jobs. That's right. And, and then they get new people in who would, will advise the government on the policy settings that that government wants, not what the civil service wants. Well, that's because the model of governance actually works differently. And we have the Westminster model where the ministers are basically the heads of government ministries. Um, And below that, you've got a you've got public service, whereas in the States, um, the uh, the executive actually operates from the president down. So when you change the president, you change the whole executive. And they remove several layers of um, uh, secretaries and assistant secretaries and assistant deputy secretaries um, who are basically political appointees every time there's a change uh, in the in the president. So that's a, quite a different model, and I'm not sure whether it's actually better. We could have we could have some quite interesting discussions about that comparison. <laughs> but, but you're you're it's a you're whole a other subject. Yeah, you're a bit of an expert in governance. If you have a quick perusal of the of the former board of Kainga Ora, it doesn't take you very long to realise why they're in an absolute mess. It, it's a whole bunch of woke uh, and ill-qualified people who are making decisions based on hope rather than reality. Well, while we're thinking about that, let's just not lose the point about um, what you were talking about before where... Yeah. You have a change of government. Now we have a national government that wants to um, take a critical look at some of the things that have been going on in government and they want to change some things and they've been quite open about some of the things they want to change. But you, um, this is where I've uh, been, talked with Paul Brennan on occasion in the past and spoken about the, import, the importance of the executive because basically – what this current government now will be facing is a tide of uh, ministerial advice that will be coming from all government ministries and and departments written by public service public servants who've operated under the previous administration. So you'll be continuing to get um, all the tide of um, what we call what we can call woke stuff, <laughs> left of centre stuff. Um, Support to uh, uh, Māori and iwi staff, um, you know, all that stuff. So it's going to take uh, quite a while to change um, mm. the kind of advice that they're getting um, as well as to enforce a, a new change in the public service because it's resisted for quite a long time in terms of um, that tide of advice that comes back up and it consists of, you know, <laughs> if you... Think of the old Yes Minister program. It's not too bad a comparison where you've got... It was a documentary, actually. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Um, And I can, you know, provide many examples of that sort of stuff. Oh, look, I know exactly what you're talking about. And this is why I maintain that when we have a change of government, 
they should call in all the heads of department from all over the country, call them all into a big meeting room, you know, at a hotel somewhere or something like that, film it if necessary, and pick three of them, really senior, and just sack them cold right there. And then so, so you can pack your bags off on your way, bye-bye, out the door. Right, and then when as they leave the door, clicks closed, you go, then you do, you say, right, now, you get the idea what's going to happen if you don't play ball? And and yeah. give them that shock. But right now, I mean, you take the, um, you know, to digress into a, a dysfunctional uh, government department, another one, you'd have to say the police is pretty dysfunctional. We've got rampant crime. We've got a uh, a commissioner who wants whose nickname is Cuddles. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. Uh, <laughs> and you've got a police minister who used to be a dog handler, and he's part of the crew. We're not going to see an improvement in the police until we get a commissioner that's actually going to do a serious job. Yes. But, you know, they retain the confidence of the minister. God knows why they retain the confidence. I mean, these people are morons. But I think that this government also, um, and and I think it's a mistake to, uh, uh, to do one thing, which the, uh, the, the review, uh, the the Bill English Review, if it, we might call it that, mm. um, is also doing, which is to blame everything on operational efficiencies. And um, and in this case, I think there's justification for doing that, and we can talk about some of that. Mm. But um, also, I think we've got to a, a crunch point in New Zealand society and governance where, you know, we need to go back to first principles and talk about uh, what it is that we want, what kind of um, uh, what kind of mandates the government ha- has for, for doing very thing, various things and should be doing, um, and to take a, a very close look at what's actually been happening in governance over the last few decades. And I think, you know, in housing, if we take housing, for example, you know, if you start from the first principle that um, any government policy or action is an intervention, it's an intervention in the economy and in society. So if you're going to intervene, then you need to look, you know, it needs to start with a thorough um, kind of cost, uh, uh, you know, uh, application of cost benefit principles, which is if you're going to intervene, then what are you going to do to intervene? Who's getting the benefit of that? And what's the benefit to the taxpayer? It seems to me that in the last few decades, we've completely gone away from that consideration of who, what's the benefit to the taxpayer. Mm. And, you know, we're coming solely at it from the be- from the consideration of, of um, what the government can do to benefit, benefit certain uh, sectors um, of the economy, what the government can do to benefit certain groups and, um, you know, c- including the emphasis that's been on certain ethnic groups. Um, and But if we are going to do that, then what's the cost of that and what's the benefit to the overall taxpayer? Because yeah, all- I mean, it, 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 And if you're a, a Labour person, they don't care about cost-benefit analysis in their world, they just look at all government spending as good government spending, and you're seeing this argument now uh, with the talk about tax cuts, where you see these morons in the mainstream media who say to the minister, well, how are you going to pay for the tax cuts? Yes. Yeah. Which, if you think about it, it's just illogical, but that's the, that's the question that the media poses all the time. If you look on the Herald Today or the stuff, they'll be saying how the government is going to pay for its tax cuts. Yes. Um, it would, but the reality is, is tax cuts aren't paid for by any government. They're taking less from the taxpayer. And so what they need to be framing the question is, is what services are you going to cut because of the reduction in revenue that you're going to get? Well, but the, exactly. But of, course, but of course, it's not as simple as that, because if you reduce personal tax, give tax cuts, then those people have got more money to spend and then that goes into the economy, which then you get GST and all the other things that flow on from that. So it's a little bit complex, but it's far too complex for a, a journalist who's 18 and spotty to be able to ask a question like that of a minister. 
Yes, and you can also see, um, I mean, that you know, we <laughs> we know that the uh, the media is largely woke captured, yep. and so um, you know the questions that they ask are, are ridiculous, and you know all the hand wringing that's gone on recently in the media about loss of public service um, jobs, and you know some of the claims that are being made are absolutely ridiculous, you know. If you have an um, a, an army of of nanny state uh, government employees, and then you start um, trying to trying to cut back on on that army, then the media immediately takes the tries to take the government to task for all the calamity that will uh, ensue if you just take a few hundred public servants out of the mix. You know, we're going to have a disaster in education if we um, if we re, re, you know, remove a few public servants in the Ministry of Education. You know, we're going to have um, a massive increase in accidents if we don't have uh, people in the Accident uh, Compensation Commission. <laughs> you know, I mean, some of the claims are re- totally ridiculous. Well, the Taxpayers Union had a video they put out on on Tuesday. It was on Twitter. I don't know if it's on other social media, but they. They've installed a, a piece of sort of living art um, in Parliament, uh, and what they've done is they've got a whole lot of boxes, and each box represents a thousand staff. And so they, they they had a pile of boxes that represented the number of civil servants that existed um, in 2017, and then they had the, a number another pile of boxes which was twice as large as the uh, as the first pile of boxes. I think there were 64 boxes or something like that stacked up. And uh, and then they had a little stack of four boxes, and that represents the cuts that the media and the Public Service Association call savage and brutal, right? It was 4,000 jobs out of 68,000 or something like that. Yeah. Uh, very large number of, of you know, boxes in these mountains. It was a very a good graphic display of just how we're manipulated by the mainstream media and their pals in the unions as to what, you know, they use terms like brutal and savage and things like that. You know, I was, I'm looking at the numbers and I'm thinking, well, I think they can cut harder. Yes, absolutely. I swing that axe. I do yes. too, but I'm, I wish that the public could be uh, more assured that the public servants are the who are who are losing their jobs are actually the ones who need to lose their jobs, <laughs> who've, been, <laughs> who've been giving, you know the. Um, I, I don't think you're going to see much um, attrition at the senior management or even petty management levels. Um, it's more uh, if it's done on a percentage basis, and it's also left up to the ministries and departments themselves. Um, then you know to make make those decisions. If you're just given a percentage, oh, we want you to reduce your staff numbers by X or your operational expenditure by X, then the people who've been making the decisions in the past aren't likely to want their own jobs to go. So, you know, I I think um, if you're going to do those cuts with a view to improving performance, um, you have to, have to actually look at what that performance is. But I think also that, you know, some of the models that are in play at the moment are just not the right models um, for the uh, for the kind of government performance that we want to see and and for the betterment of society. Well, you know, and I mentioned before about, you know, the Labour Party has this view that all government spending is sacred and it's all perfect and there's no waste. And so any time that uh, a government uh, suggests that they're going to cut some uh, spending, then there's howls of outrage. I mean, yesterday I put something on Twitter about the tax cuts. Uh, you know that premise that they're not funded by the government; they're they're just going to have to spend less. And and all these lefty fools came and attacked me on Twitter and said, uh, you know, what are you going to do when we have to reduce government services? Well, well, the government se- sector is twice as large as it was in the fifties. What? How did we yes. get on in the fifties? Yes, exactly. Yeah. And and that's one of the points that I, you know, was having a rant about. Yeah, about looking at history. You know, I did the same yes. thing about school lunches. You know, they said, oh, if we take away or adjust the school lunches, who will feed the kids? 
Well, who fed the kids in the 50s well, and 60s exactly. when we exactly. were at school? You know, yes. Who fed us? Oh, that's right. It was our parents that yes. did it. Uh, who fed the kids during the pandemic when all the schools were shut? Well, exactly. But <laughs> who feeds them in the holidays? But it's, I think it's, you know, it's even more important to go back and look at things like, um, and we're talking about housing. So in the 40s and the 50s, um, and the 60s and 70s, <laughs> the government was able to build um, thousands of houses, got um, pe- uh, a lot of people into home ownership. Mm. And, you know, if you look at that, I want to go back and look at that model and compare it to what we're doing today. Um, thousands of, ho- of people were helped into home ownership. Um, and... Uh, and people were provided rental accommodation, which was um, built and provided at a, at a good standard. Now, how were we able to do that back then, but we can't build it now? We can't even build houses now. No. If you look at the horrible developments that Kainga Aurea is now doing, you know, how did we get to the stage where we're building these horrible little houses in what are going to be in another 10 years' time, you know, new um slum lots, um, you know, horrible little houses. There's nowhere for kids to to play. There's hardly any room for anybody to even move. And we're buying, you know, we're sending all our logs to China and then we're buying metal housing containers from China to shove onto city lots and they look like, um, you know, lots of metal sheds bolted on top of each other. They're not going to look. Is, they're not going to look like the artist's impression that we're all told they're going to look like. And, and <laughs> well, in ten right. and in ten years' time, they're going to look dilapidated and awful as well. Um, but you know, I agree with you, and I think part of the problem is there's this willingness in New Zealand to let the government meddle in things, right? And, and the government almost never meddles properly in in any area. And a classic example is health and safety, right? Can you remember? You know, back in the day when you were going on a trip um, on a holiday and you come across some roadworks, you never saw a cone, right? You watched out for the truck and the digger, and there was a guy with a stop-go sign standing on the side of the road. Now there is a million cones, um, there's automated traffic lights, there's a whole lot of stuff holding everybody up, uh, and, you know, lane changes and all this sort of thing under the guise of health and safety instead of common sense. Um, and uh, and the costs of building or repairing roads have increased exponentially. We've seen that too in housing. We've seen you know uh, this creep. I call it creeping death of regulation, right? That somebody will come up with an idea. We need a regulation for this, and so they pass a regulation. And now all of a sudden, some things that weren't being done before in housing now have to be done to meet the regulation. And so the costs go up, and so houses get up and up and up and up in price, and, and commodities, uh, you know, have to comply with all sorts of new regulations because some womble somewhere says, "Well, we need to have draft-free houses." And, okay, yes. cool. We'll have draft-free houses, and then we have an epidemic of of black mold growing in houses because people don't open their windows. You know, I can remember when yeah. I was a kid. I can remember when I was a kid. Mum would, you know, we'd get up in the morning. And mum would walk around the house and she would open all the windows, even in winter, open yeah. all the windows. How many people do that now? Yeah. And so you've not only got an epidemic of black mould in houses, but then you've got an em- epidemic of respiratory-related stuff mm-hmm. because um, because people are living in crowded um, and, and, you know, can't afford the electricity. Um, and so they live in one room. They don't open the windows, and then you get respiratory problems associated with all of that. So a lot of those problems are lifestyle things. They're not specifically housing-related things. So, you know, there's a lot that we could talk about in that, but if you want to look at the history of housing in New Zealand, um, well, if you want to know why we're in the current mess we're in, um, I think you have to go back and look at the history because – you know, as we were just saying, in the 1950s, how come we were able to build thousands of houses for people? We were able to build dams and roads and, you know, and all of it was done 
in New Zealand. Um, by and, New Zealanders using and, New Zealand resources. Yes, by by New Zealand taxpayers. But now, you know, it seems we can we can hardly do anything without importing everything from overseas and including the labour to do things. But you look at the houses that were built in the 50s and 60s, they usually had removed floors or matai flooring or, you know, we had good quality hardwoods that were yeah. put, put into our properties. They're, they're rock solid buildings. You yeah, know, and and most of concrete them still tile are. roofs usually, you know. Um, yeah, nothing. And those was, those yeah. same houses, you know, are basically, um, you know, they're many of them have been sold off and renovated, you know, but they're basically solid, um, good quality, well built houses. But we don't seem to be able to do it now. But I think um, let's go back and talk about some of the critical policy changes yeah, and yeah. shifts. So. During the 1940s, um, you know, after the war and even before, there was a, um, a housing shortage and a need for um, for more effort with housing. The government started that with the Labor government as far back as I think 1930s, they built the yep. 1930s. I think the first state house was 1937. Um, I should I should say that as part of my years in public service, I did actually work in the housing sector mm. um, for quite a few years. And then as a consultant, I came back and I um, was a contracted um, consultant manager for Housing New Zealand on a particular project. Um, so I have actually worked inside the, mm. um, the government agencies associated with this. But in the 40s, um, the 30s and 40s, you know, it was about um, building good quality rental housing. Um, but it was also about housing for New Zealanders. So there wasn't, and what I think one of the worst things that's happened over the years since is this uh, is renaming um, uh, state housing as um, social housing. And if you do that, you get into a whole lot of things. But back then, it was just housing for New Zealanders. And I remember mm. my parents. Um, you know, who were actually, uh, and a lot of people that I later talked to when I was working in the housing sector, um, you know, pe people after the war were really grateful to get those houses. It wasn't a stigma to get a state housing, a state house. And in fact, it was open to everybody. It was just a matter of, of applying. Wasn't there a state services advance or it was something advances yeah yeah and it, it was, was advances about, yeah yes it was a, and that name was about how the state was helping the society to advance basically that was mm. the concept and then so it was about rental housing but it was open to everybody so there was no um you know you just applied if you wanted a, sta a state house you didn't you didn't have to go through, you know, um, being assessed as um, socially deprived. Um, mm. It was open to people, and um, and lots of people were really grateful to have a, a good quality rental house because the which you could buy if you yes. wanted. Yeah. Well, that came in a bit later, and then in the 1950s, the national government at that time decided to um, put more emphasis on home ownership. And, you know, that was a particular plank in our housing model, which went on for decades. And the concept of that was that home ownership was a good thing because it gave, um, it gave people uh, a sense of responsibility over um, their property and where they were living. Mm. Um, and, um, and it also provided for the whole societal model and that if you, um, if you had a mortgage, you know, you took out for a 30 year term, by the time you retired, you were um, free of that cost. Yeah. And so you didn't need quite so much money for, um, you know, for, for your superannuation and retirement needs. There was now, also the family benefit as well, which you could cash in, couldn't you, to yes, apply yeah. to buy a house? Right. Mm. So, so the model was that home ownership was a good thing, and um, and I think that's right as a society. Home a home ownership um, is, you know, to have a, a high level of home ownership is to have a healthy um, society and a, and a healthy housing market. 
And then, um, and once again, those, uh, so the, the government provided state advances loans and they were um, uh, flat rate interest and later that changed. And what also changed was the eligibility criteria. So then it became, and by the time we got through to the 1970s, then both the rental housing and the home ownership assistance was targeted at first home buyers and low income, uh, low income people. And the logic was that, um, you know, people who were over a certain income level could be deemed to provide for themselves. They could go to banks and get loans or they could get rental housing through the private sector. Um, and um, the assistance was targeted at um, those who couldn't afford to do that. But that model and you know, if I look at what was happening in housing provision in the 1970s and 1980s, it all changed in the late 1980s and 1990s, was that that model worked particularly well because um, what you had was people getting into rental housing if they couldn't afford uh, couldn't afford it and there was a, a kind of a, a targeted sector somewhere in the middle of the, the population who could be supported into home ownership. Now, the thing that that did was also provided a revenue stream to government. And so the government uh, got the return in terms of the, the rentals and the rental payments and also the, the mortgage repayments. And that provided a considerable source of revenue for the government. So what then happened in the late 1980s and in the early 1990s, the national government um, decided to restructure um, what was then the housing corporation mm. um, and sell off the um, the portfolio of housing corporation loans. And what happened then was that um, the uh, the loan portfolios were sold off to the bank banks, private sector banks. Yep. And the ideology at the time was, um, you know, the it started with the reforms of the Labor government back in the 1980s and they were captured by Milton Friedman and the whole ideology of free market economics and mm. privatisation and what have you. So the ideology at the time was that the government shouldn't be a bank and should, and that should all go to the private sector. But what was done at the time, which I think, has proved to me the most horrible um, policy decision um, over many decades was that the accommodation supplement was brought in. Mm. And that did all kinds of things because then, uh, and, you know, in the in the 80s, um, amongst people who were working in the housing sector, we used to talk about how the, um, the presence of um, the government housing agency um, in the overall housing market, we, we didn't really know um, what the effect of that was. And so in the 1990s, um, there were various experiments to, to try and um, find that out and to move the emphasis to the private sector. And so then what happened is um, the accommodation supplement came in. And so basically you're transferring a huge amount of government subsidy from home ownership to the rental sector. And you're basically then since, in those decades since, we're propping up, the taxpayer is propping up the private rental sector. Mm -hmm. And all that subsidy is going, um, it's not produced, it's all, it's completely dead money. It's not providing any benefit to the taxpayer at all, except those who are involved in uh, private rental management, mm. property management. Um, and, you know, whether that's, um, I mean, that's that's a very deliberate um, policy choice. What are you trying to do? Are you trying to create um, a, a population which is in home ownership mainly, or do you want a population that's largely in in the rental sector? And well, living rentals with all the consequences that that has. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is the way I look at it. If you don't own something, you won't treat it as well. 
Absolutely. Right? So it That's- goes for everything. It goes for if you rent a car, you'll thrash the hell out of that car because it's not yours. Yes. And, and, and you don't have to cover the cost of the of the expenses and, hey, I've paid for it anyway, it's, so it's rented, so I'll do it. You rent a camper van, you're going to treat it um, yeah, improperly. Everything that you rent, you treat less well than if you owned it. Right. And I understand what, you know, the ideology at the time was, oh, well, the, um, the accommodation supplement, because we we basically already had an accommodation supplement for the rental sector, but only as it related to public housing in the form of the income-related rent subsidies. So state house tenants um, were, uh, uh, you know, paying only about 25%, a maximum of 25% of their income. So that existed before, but applied to, um, public rental housing. So now you applied it to the private rental housing sector. Now, what happened immediately was that, yes, it encouraged a lot more private individuals and maybe companies um, to go into um, rental rental investments, but housing prices shot up, rent shot up, because, as you say... Supplements um, shot up. <laughs> yeah. It's just and, a circle of and, death, really. And the projections that were applied to what that accommodation and supplement was going to cost at the time have been massively, hugely, monstrously exceeded by then. Now the taxpayer is paying out billions in the form of the accommodation supplement every year. And what benefit to the taxpayer overall? Absolutely nothing. It's dead money. And I looked recently, uh, I looked at the um, the review report and it's clear that um, after Kainga Aura was formed in uh, 2019, mm. um, there has been an effort to try and look at um, assisting people into home ownership. But the products that they developed to have around that and um, the mechanisms that they're using a, would involve a tremendous amount of energy and time going into staff working on those things. Um, and basically what they mean is that, um, again, uh, staff funded by the taxpayer are basically working for the banks mm. um, because they're doing a whole lot of the facilitation between um, people who want to get into home ownership and um, the banks to try and um, deal with the, I can talk about various options that they've had. Um, and so you're working, you've got government staff working for the banks to set up loans where they can. Um, and you've got government staff working for the iwi because they've had a huge uh, investment in, um, uh, I think it's called Kainga um, uh, Whenua. Um, so which touches on the second part of the the e- yeah. your email the 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 treaty debate, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. And this is about building on uh, Maori land, uh, including multiply owned Maori land. Mm. Now, when I was working in the housing sector, we started the government agency um, at the time. Housing Corporation was starting to look at that, and they were starting to get into early work on. Uh, investment in uh, Papakainga housing, building on multiply owned land. Mm. Now, the facilitation, administration and staff costs around doing that are quite large. But if you're also going to fund the iwi through um, the massive funding that's gone in, in, um, you know, in, in iwi development over the years, in the form of and under the guise of, I mean, Helen Clark started all this really when they started crapping on about a partnership, and then well, all this Maori had to be nonsense. involved in everything. And, yes. and so now you've got a duplication of resources, a duplication of of uh, government money being poured into two separate areas. Um, no increase in service or, or or what you get for that money. Uh, all on the premise that. Uh, somehow if we just pour money into these groups, everything's going to be better with no... Well, absolutely, and that that is clear when you look at this. Um, at uh, I mean, you can look on Kainga Aura website um, and you'll see 
the huge emphasis that's given to this um, uh, kāinga whenua um, emphasis and working with iwi um, to build uh, uh, kāinga development. Now, we started to play around with that in the uh, late 1980s, early 90s. Um, and when you're working with um, the whole legal um, structural and institutional arrangements relating to multiply owned land, it's it's quite complex. But over the decades, um, since the 80s, we've had um, huge treaty claims. Um, so uh, billion f- and, over and, over four and a half billion dollars. And um, and lots of money um, from government going into um, iwi, iwi development. Um, huge amounts of money have gone in that direction. And as a result, we've got a number of large Māori corporates around around the company. And they're basically now functioning as, as private sector corporates. Well, if you're going to do that, then make those entities responsible for um, doing the work around building on multiply owned or iwi owned iwi owned land, why should government agencies still be nanny stating that right through from proposal to fruition? Um, and in addition to that, you've also government got government agencies that are uh, that are involved in that. So either put that on the iwi themselves, or um, take the facilitation of that back to to Pirni Kaukri. I don't know what they do these days, except write stupid reports like uh, "Hey, poor poor." Um, but if you're going to do that, and you're going to involve, you know, all the complexity of working around um, the Maori Land Court and registering through there, and um, and getting these developments off the ground, then put that with who benefits from it. Why should the uh, why should the overall taxpayer um, be funding be funding that? Now, you know, you'll see lots of um, blah, blah, both on the Kainga Ora website and also on um, uh, in the review report. And there's lots of stuff about uh, outcomes, um, uh, diversity of housing, place-based approaches. You know, it's all got um, tremendously complex but I think we basically need to go back to first principles in terms of what do people need um, in housing. They either need some level of support to get into home ownership or yep. um, they need a good rental house. And, and you can't tell me that it's it's actually any much more complicated than that. Those are the basic needs of society. And I think we need to go back to first principles and um, and what can be done effectively, and also what is the return to the overall taxpayer? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, that's you're right though. I mean, when we started uh, state housing, there was a need, right? The, the, and when the government's going to step into the market, and we're going to provide uh, a affordable, effective housing for what New Zealand society was at that time, right? Now society's changed a little bit. We've got different you know styles of families and all sorts of things like that but that's what we need to do is we need to have a bold government that will say this is the level of housing that the government will provide and it, it's not going to be you know it's not going to be five bedrooms and four bathrooms and a 15 car garage right it's it's not going to be that it's going to be you know a three bedroom or four bedroom house uh etc and then set about providing that that at a reasonable cost for people to rent, and then bring back that uh, state advances maybe, or some sort of facility for that, so that people can then, if they move into their state house, they can then uh, look at buying it. Now, there's people who are living in state houses have lived there for forty years, you know, on yeah. cheap, on cheap rent, and then they're crying poverty. Well, well, they've had a much better housing outcome for them than someone who didn't get into a state house and squat there for 40 years? <laughs> well, they're supposed to um, exercise security of tenure for as long as it's needed. So if you're going to do that, then, you, you know, you have to be able to have systems in place to assess the ongoing need. 
But, um, you know, what we've had since the 1990s, when if you, I'm actually an advocate for um, the government providing uh, a level of subsidised loans. And when I look at everything that um, Kainga Ora was, was set up to do in providing that, I mean, they're basically trying to do everything except provide the actual loan itself. Mm. And so when I say they're working for the banks, you know, there's lots of um, – they had they they had a, a home ownership first loan grants, which has now been stopped. Um, there's all lots of stuff about the advisory assistance provided, first home decision tool, guide to home ownership staff, first home loans. And this is interesting because um, they've worked with selected banks they, well, they've nominated a group of selected banks who will um, offer these first home loans um, and other lenders uh, involved in that too. But um, these are provided at 5% deposit to selected applicants. Um, but then Kainga Aura is underwriting them. Well, why would you do that? You know, when you look at the um, the whole housing model since the 1990s, um, it seems to me that the there's a lot of ideology that needs to be questioned about what we're actually doing. And I think, you know, if you're going to say, well, we want uh, clearly, I mean, it's always been an objective of national governments. And part of the problem, of course, is we've had this history of um, uh, bouncing backwards and forwards between mm. Labor and National over the years. So every time Labor comes in, <clears throat> they want to spend more money on social issues and and social stuff. So then you get increased government expenditure on all of that. And then National comes in and wants to do less of that and wants to have more um, involvement of the private sector. Now, one of the things that um, is in this report is um, that I, I think basically what we're seeing is the national government agenda coming back into play mm. where they want to really get out of public housing. And this is this has been a national party agen uh, agenda really since the early 1990s. Mm. So in, in um, the restructure of housing corporation and setting up Housing New Zealand just to be a landlord um, <clears throat> and selling off and doing away with the um, the subsidised government loans for home ownership, um, what they were trying to do was get more people involved and in, uh, get more investors involved in the private rental sector. Mm. Um, and that agenda about getting out of public housing um, through the 1990s, was, there was a huge sell-off of um, of state um, mm. ha ha state house properties. Um, and a lot of that, um, you know, then you had um, stuff about slum landlords and people not maintaining those properties because they were all bought at, you know, bargain basement prices. But the, but the government didn't maintain them either. That's well, the well, you, yes, you can say that. And, and for that, you had to look at um, you have to look at the operational efficiencies. Um, of managing, you know, a whole maintenance budget. And obviously over time you've got an obsolescence issue and things become more expensive to maintain. But that's when um, if you're going to have a housing, uh, a government-funded housing agency with a rental portfolio, you've got to let them manage it efficiently. efficiently. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm um, <clears throat> under... Uh, when Phil Goff was minister, he was trying to get into more of that um, and selling off uh, state houses in um, in the more affluent areas. Um, yeah, like Oraki and places like good, that. Yeah, good prices. And then you could build more in, in yep. areas where it was cheaper to build. Now, that's entirely logical. But then Helen Clark came in as minister and said, um, oh, no, you know, we're not uh, – we're, going to, we're not going to have that because um, poor people should be able to live in affluent areas um, just like everybody else. So you yeah, sell they pepper potted. That's when they started pepper potting houses. Yes. They, they, every, every new subdivision that was – Danny Moore is like that in Auckland, right? There's a joke in Auckland, um, you know, don't worry about moving to Danny Moore, it's coming to you. But what would, they would do is that they would release a whole lot of sections 
and housing corporation back then would then buy up usually a place at the, at the end of a cul-de-sac, uh, a couple of sections there. So the four houses around the end of a cul-de-sac were housing corporation houses, and then everybody else would then buy their sections, build their $800,000 house, and then wake up the next morning and there's four state houses that have been put at the end of their street all of a sudden. Yeah. It's just a recipe for disaster. Well, um, you know, this is where I, I talk about, you know, the experiments that have been done, <laughs> done over the years. And we need to go back and look at, you know, things that have been done in the past and say, well, what worked well and what didn't. And it seems to me that um, the ideology of wanting to get uh, rid of public housing and will get the government out of um, public housing or social housing um, and transfer it all to the public sector. The, the report, the review report that's just been done, I think it's actually a, a Trojan horse for getting back to what National had been trying to do in various um, uh, during various uh, national governments. Um, and under the John Key government, they were looking at trying to transfer more public housing um, yep. to to community housing providers. Now, that's still very much a very strong theme. And I looked at some of that when um, uh, that was being um, worked on as proposals. Um, and Treasury, and I might say that, you know, one thing that needs to be looked at is is the duplication of effort over the entire public sector about housing. So at that time, uh, under the John Key government, you had a, a unit in Treasury that was looking at housing. You had an MB unit that was looking at housing. You had various housing government entities from the ministry down to um, Housing New Zealand before Kainga was formed and so on. Um, and <clears throat> what they were wanting to do then was basically transfer groups of um, state housing properties to community housing providers in the form of a suspensory loan. <clears throat> so basically what you did was give those properties to community housing providers um, uh, and um, then they become, they go, you know, off the, uh, the government asset as a, a, a physical asset, but they remain on the balance a financial sheet asset. as a as a debt, right? Mm -hmm. in the, because you've got these suspensory loans. Um, and then the idea was that uh, the um, the community housing provider would then be responsible for the ongoing maintenance. So you got rid of the maintenance costs, um, and the rents would also go to the community housing provider. So then what you've got by, by doing that um, is uh, the state, you know, has, has lost um, the asset, although they keep it on the balance sheet as it's a debt. It's a debt. transfer of wealth but, to, pri to a private sector. Yes, but there's no return to the taxpayer in doing that, except that you've got the cost of maintenance off, um, off the, government, the government budget. So... If you're going to have um, an ideology of wanting the, the private sector to be more involved in housing, which is what's been being tried in various forms over the last 30 years, is, um, you know, what um, what's where is the best investment for government funds to go? Um, and if you're going to do that by getting the government out of public housing, but then you're propping you're spending zillions propping up the private sector to provide that. You know, if you're going to have private sector providers, they need to be able to do it on the basis that every other private business works and not, you know, with pouring um, billions into into propping that up just so that you can say, well, we've got other providers involved. See, that's the thing. I've always disagreed with government policy that involves a subsidy to a sector or or uh, you know particular hobby horse of of a politician, because what a government can give in the form of subsidies, a, a later government can take away, and it's not a real business. And if you are propping up a sector, that sector doesn't exist by itself. It, it needs to find its own level 
of where things are at. Uh, and subsidies, as you say, it's a government intervention, right? Yeah. And when governments intervene in a the market, they actually screw the market up. They never actually improve it. Uh, no, it's, it might be a temporary improvement, but eventually the market will find its own level and then the subsidies have either grown enormously or are no longer needed. But invariably, the subsidies have grown enormously. Right. Well, I think the challenge for this government is, or should be, to look at those basic first principles. Mm. Um, what what does the government want to do in terms of providing assistance to the population? If you're going to if you're going to intervene um, in the in the market, then you need to be very clear about what it is that you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Um, and I, I I would recommend that basically. You know all this ballyhoo about diversity and what what is needed to provide it. I think we actually need to go back to a much more egalitarian approach mm. um, and just think about you know what are the what are the simple interventions you want yeah, to stop encourage. talking about uh, you know stop talking about uh, whether it's a Pacifica person or a Maori person or or whatever a, a, a trans person or you know stop all of that. Let's just start talking about people well, right? and the to, need of the population. If you want to be realistic about where government expenditure is going, you basically need to stop all of, it, all of that because it just encourages huge cost and expenditure mm. and the taxpayers paying for it. And so this is where I think, you know, there needs to be this current review that's been done, for a start, it's really it's not looked at the issue of home ownership at all. It's all yeah, about you're right, social though, it's housing. A, yeah, it's a, it's a tr you're right in in the in that it's a Trojan horse because this is what politicians do, right? If you're going to fix something, you have to have a problem that needs fixing. So they've done a report that says here's the problem. And, and there are demonstrable problems in Kainga Aura that need to be fixed. But the connected thinking between the solution and what the problem is hasn't been done yet. No. And and I think, you know, we've got this legacy where um, traditionally it's usually been uh, Labour governments that have embarked on, you know, big change policy directions or, you know, big spending of, of government. And then National comes in and wants to wind back some of that. But what they usually do is um, tinker. They tinker, tinker. tinker around the edges and don't go back to first principles and saying, well, what are we actually doing here and what's the model that we want to have? So I think, you know, currently we've got a model that's in a complete mess. It's going to continue to be a mess. And it'll and, be in a mess for the foreseeable future until they address what it is they're trying to achieve. And if they they probably don't even know. The National Party probably doesn't even know what they want to achieve there. And that sort of thinking is being done by David Seymour and, and Winston Peters. Well, um, I think this is where um, ACT and um, New Zealand First needs to put more pressure on government because they need to stop this trend where National comes in, you know, makes a big ballyhoo about changing things and just tinkers around the edges and it all gets worse and it all gets more expensive for the next government. And I do think that going back and looking at what what models we've had in the past, where they worked, where they didn't. I mean, one thing to say about um, the, all the nonsense about partnership is that actually the um, the the model that the housing corp old housing corporation had um, was in fact a partnership, if you want to call it. Oh, that. It was yeah, absolutely um, right. It was a partnership with the private sector because um, the corporation bought land. Um, they re released um, sections which were then um, you know. Ha um, uh, able to be um, handed over to private developers. Um, the private developers built houses. Yep. Um, People like Keith, that's how Keith A. Holmes got started. Yep, all right? of that. They all built that. The, They built the best state houses. You know, they had a con Fletcher's were the same, Fletcher housing, exactly the same. He had a contract, produced a 1,000 houses, boom, there it is. 
Yes, so there was a benefit to the private sector because private developers were involved in doing that. Um, and there was a benefit to the taxpayer in that um, the government got a return from those subsidised loans. <coughs> and I think that model needs to be looked at again. And so does all the complexity of providing basically tenancies, whether it's through uh, the government is what remains on the the government portfolio as uh, public housing properties, or whether it's what you're doing to uh, support the private sector. And, you know, let's not be confused. If you're talking about community housing providers, you are talking about the private sector. They have and, to. And the way that, you know, it's operating at the moment, if you shove thousands more properties um, at the community housing providers, in 10 years' time, you're going to have mess of that because, you know, they won't be able to sustain either no. the maintenance costs or or the social costs that come from the uh, the sector of society that you're trying to provide for. If you have, you know, if you're going to be the housing provider of last re resort, you're always going to have tenant management problems. And the interesting thing about one of the little uh, figures that's in the review report is that actually the tenant management costs for Kainga Ora are only about 15% of the um, uh, of the operating expenditure, mm. which isn't much. So actually it isn't costing all that much to maintain the tenancy management, despite all the social issues that you get with it if you, you know, if you're going to be the housing provider of last resort. So you have to look at that and say, well, what are the staff then doing that are involved in tenancy management, and clearly one of the things that they're doing is not chasing arrears. Oh, it was a mat. Was it growing from a million dollars to ten million or something like that? It was some outrageous amount of money? Well, the operating expenses have gone from one point one point five billion in two thousand and nineteen to two point five billion uh, in uh, two thousand twenty three. The debt's um, gone to $12 billion, as is forecasted to $23 billion, and there's been a huge escalation of both expenditure and debt. And, um, and meanwhile, the, um, the arrears in terms of the rental payments have obviously also gone up hugely. Mm. So everything, um, everything basically is a financial disaster. It's, it's wonky. I don't think we. I don't think you or I are going to solve this, and, and we're running up against time now. So, I think take you take your point. We need to go back to first principles. What is it that the government is in the business of doing, and what is the benefit to the taxpayer in doing that? Yes, and it needs to start out from an objective position, not maintaining an ideology at the start, and then saying, "Well, how do how do we um, how do we make this work?" Mm. Because you know what they're propping up at the moment is just incredible. Yeah, it's it's sort of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa with, you know, <laughs> um, subsidies here and props there and all sorts of things like that. But uh, maybe we do need to actually sit down with a blank piece of paper and draw out what we want for a housing sector for the state to provide or whatever they're going to do and decide and then decide and then have a plan to implement that. But I don't know if there's anybody who's got the stones to do that because the, there's so many vested interests, so many vested interests in the existing system. Yes. And then, of course, you know, the the problem of, you know, uh, massive over-regulation and bureaucracy has just added hugely to the cost of everything. Yeah. So, you know, these are a, a complex set of problems there, but I think a basic common sense approach to um, what, you know, what, what is the purpose of all this government intervention? What is it achieving? I'd like to actually know with all the emphasis that they have put on um, uh, various um, facilitation of um, mm. ownership, how many people have they actually got into private ownership in the last uh, few I years? Doubt, I doubt they'll be able to tell you. Well, <laughs> and there's probably. the problem. There's the problem right there. Well, Catherine, uh, we we really are up against time now. So, um, you know, we could talk about this forever, 
Um, because- <laughs> maybe we'll, uh, when we see the next report, we'll uh, catch up again and uh, see if there's any solutions in in that, because I understand that's what the government is doing, reviewing well, that in the future. Yes. We also need to think about who's advising the government. <laughs> oh, we do. <laughs> Well, thank you very much for coming on the crunch. Uh, it's been it's been interesting, Cam. Great to talk to you. <laughs> yeah, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Now, do you see what I mean about getting experts on the show to share with us their insights? Isn't it far better than listening to the talking heads from other media? Catherine provided us all with really interesting insights into housing, and she should know too, having been in the trenches inside government helping formulate policy. Now, we ran out of time to squeeze in our discussion about the treaty and the radical advancement of the Maori Renaissance, as she calls it, inside the government sector. But don't worry, that will be in next week's show. Let me know your thoughts on that interview with Catherine by emailing inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR, Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to or dislike what you're listening to, either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057, that's 2057, or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.